I'm not trying to be controversial. I'm only sharing what I know. And the way that I practice medicine is based on <clears throat> what I know, it's based on ethics, and it's based on first doing no harm, and that's the Hippocratic Oath. Let's start to talk about cardiovascular disease, because <clears throat> how well are we doing with that? In, from a conventional medicine point of view, how well are we managing cardiovascular disease? And is, are there things that we can do to improve it? <clears throat> I say that there are, and that's why the topic is cardiovascular innovations. First of all, I know these are 2002 figures, but it just gives you, and, and this, this incidence, this death rate in Western society is the same. The three biggest killers are still cancer, ischemic heart disease, and stroke, cerebrovascular disease, and look at the, it's killing over 7 million people each year. If you look at the, the, the bit in yellow at the bottom, there are another 15 million people each year survive minor strokes, and there are 600 million people walking around with high blood pressure, and they are, of course, at risk of heart disease, and, of course, stroke and cardiac failure. So, if you like, the mortality rates are really just the tip of the iceberg. What are some of the risks? I've got risks for cancer and for heart disease on this slide. I pinched it from another, from another, uh, another lecture. But you'll see, actually, there's some commonality in both lists. But I want you to focus on the right-hand side. Of course, heart disease will increase as we get older. Most diseases do. Yes, there is a hereditary link. Smoking, of course. High cholesterol, which I'm going to say something about, because it's not what you think. High blood pressure, inactivity, obesity, of course, as been mentioned already, diabetes, stress, alcohol, and that one never gets on the list. Phytonutrient deficit, in other words, not eating enough plant foods. But did you know this? Or maybe I'm, maybe I'm stealing my own thunder if I tell you that now. Now let's wait, I'll tell you, I'll tell you that in a little while. Okay, let's look at heart disease. The incidence rate for heart disease is the same now as it was in the early 70s. One in three people who have a heart attack will actually die from it, they will not recover. It does not recognize gender or race boundaries. <coughs> Women's death from heart disease is eight times the mortality rate of breast cancer ladies. So actually eight times more women die from heart disease than they do from breast cancer. So to put things into context, now, here's, here's an interesting point. Japanese men living in California have higher incidence of heart disease than Japanese men in Japan. Now, why would that be the case, do you think? <laughs> Lifestyle, right? And and the, pardon? Iodine. Iodine could be. Well, it could be, but certainly diet and lifestyle in general. Yeah? So what we know about heart disease, and by the way, it's the same for cancer. You get the same migration data is when you adopt the lifestyle of the country that you're in, you will adopt the risk factors of that country as well. So clearly, we can't put everything down to genetics. If disease process is affected by environment, and that includes internal environment that we create ourselves, right? Our lifestyles. So if that's true, surely we can alter our risk of vascular and cardiovascular disease by altering our lifestyle. That's just logical, isn't it? So really, as doctors, what we should be focusing on more, and you, this, you'll understand more of what the, the reasons behind this statement in a minute, the reasons why we should focus more on prevention and lifestyle changes is because it makes more impact than our current drug therapy. I have no hesitation in saying that. Look at this, folks published in Journal of American Medical Association, actually as long ago as 1953. Autopsies done on soldiers who were killed in the Korean War, American soldiers, 300 soldiers' hearts, the average age was 22 years of age, 77.3% of their hearts had gross evidence of heart disease, and one in 20 of them had plaque causing 90% occlusion of the coronary artery, but they had no symptoms. So here we have young 
healthy, fit men who have an autopsy evidence of the heart disease process, but they don't have symptoms. So we have a dilemma and a problem here, folks, which is if young people have pathological change in their hearts, i.e. heart disease pathology, when should we start preventative process? It was a rhetorical question, but you, you know what I'm saying. You see, you may get the symptoms later, but the process is there from early on. Huh. So we need to do something about this. And that's why we're not winning the battle against heart disease either, is because we're, we're going in too late once the process is really established and it's more difficult to reverse. It can be reversed, but with the right modalities. Fat and cholesterol is a bit of misguided focus, and I'll come on to that in a minute. I'll explain that statement. The fact is, folks, that there's high recurring height of heart attacks, stroke rates, despite the use of current medication. If we look at, at the gold standard for treatment of heart disease, it really is, if you have a blockage in a coronary artery and it's causing symptoms, then the gold standard is to, is to buy, take a piece of vein and bypass that blocked artery so that you have the blood can get through, right? Because the, the, the angina and the heart disease is being caused by occlusion of the coronary artery. So you're, you're, you're providing another route around the block artery. Now, the problem with this is that it is expensive. <clears throat> One in 50 patients will die from the procedure. And of course, with all operations, with all surgery, there are complications like infection, high blood pressure, stroke, even a transient ischemic attacks, which are mini strokes, but, but temporary strokes, if you like. Now, here's some facts about bypass. <clears throat> 70 to 80 percent of people will be chest pain free for one year. Within three years, up to a third will suffer chest pain again. And at 10 years, 50 percent will have died or had a, re a heart attack again or a return of their chest pain. The reality is, and this is all published studies, not me saying this, is there are only certain subsets of heart disease patients who live longer due to bypass. Here's the thing. Yes, we can manage the symptoms, because bypass, sure, you, you don't have chest pain anymore, because you're getting around the blockage, but we're doing nothing about the underlying process, nor are we, through current therapies, changing the incidence of heart disease, which I've already showed you. It's still the same, it's still one of the biggest killers. We are not impacting on that as a disease process. That means, folks, it means that we have to, we have to change route. We have to think differently about where, how we're managing this. Now, this is just some figures. Most of you will know this, but in case you don't, UK blood pressure is slightly different in the States, but a low blood pressure would be 90 over 60. Since we're talking about cardiovascular disease, we've got to talk about blood pressure. Um, most of you are familiar. 90, the, the, the top figure is when the heart is contracting, the bottom figure is when the heart's relaxed. Okay, so systolic, diastolic. 90 over 60 or low would be low. High would be above 140 over 90. And normal would be above 90, 60 and below 130 over 80. Okay? So those are just some measurements that, <clears throat> for your uh, information. And you may have seen, did any of you seen the, see this in the press? It was in actually January this year. Did any of you see this stuff about blood pressure management? How doctors are rethinking how we might want to manage blood pressure. Did you see anyone see it? Yeah. Not many of you. Okay. The nuts and bolts of it are, were, are this. Oh, you saw it, Jeremy, yeah. The nuts and bolts are that actually it may be the changes in blood pressure. When blood pressure is changing, so one time it's low, next time you go to the doctors it's raised, then it's low, then it's raised. It's the, change, the rapid changes in blood, in blood pressure which may be more dangerous than a statically high blood pressure. So it means that uh, the work that's been published is now making doctors rethink how we might manage blood pressure more effectively, because it's difficult. The reality is, is blood pressure is really difficult to manage, and whereas we used to think you could manage it with one drug, now it's almost impossible to manage with one drug. People are ending up with two or three medications just to keep their blood pressure under control. 
The reality is, folks, is we need to think differently about how we're doing things and how to make a difference. <coughs> I, of course, I, one of the reasons I studied medicine was because I actually knew a lot of this, this stuff before I was medically qualified, but I studied medicine in order to, to actually have the credential to be able to do what I do now, and actually to be able to stand and chat with other doctors and, and, and share with them stuff really they did not get taught at medical school but should have. Yeah? You know where I'm coming from. Right, so, uh, doctors do not focus on good health, unfortunately. They have little time. The, the conventional me medical paradigm is fixing people once they have disease. It's not focused on keeping people well. And the tools that we do use as, in terms of preventative medicine really don't make significant impact. If they were, the statistics that I showed you at the beginning would not be as they are. You follow me? Yes. Right. So, now, now I'm going to get controversial. If you don't think I've been controversial so far, just wait a minute. <clears throat> now, this is heart disease process, okay? And this is plaque in the artery that you're looking at. Yeah, and this, you don't see this as a lumen, but there you have a clot. And this is a cut through the, the, the side of the, of, a, of the coronary artery. So you're seeing it in cross-section. What you see is, you see uh, muscle there, and you see cholesterol deposits, but you see also lots of white cells. In fact, it's the white cells which form the largest part of that plaque, not cholesterol. But cholesterol is there, and you also have calcium and fat deposits. The white cells are there to remove damaged tissue. That's what they're there for. Why are, why, what do white cells do? They kill bacteria, they engulf bacteria, but they also engulf damaged tissue, when, and they're involved in inflammatory process. Yeah? You follow that? So white cells will all either be defending you against infection, or they'll be involved in an inflammatory process in some way. So, here's the thing. When Birchoff, Rudolf Birchoff in 1850, first proposed that cholesterol was associated with heart disease, he did not say it caused heart disease. In fact, what he said was, it seems that cholesterol is present in the arteries after the initial assault on the artery occurs. And that cholesterol, he didn't say this, but actually I'm summarizing subsequent studies, cholesterol actually seems to be part of the repair process. Now, listen folks, Cholesterol is produced in the liver. Every day, you will all produce three grams of cholesterol in your liver. Three grams. The proportion that is in your bloodstream, only about five to ten percent will you derive from your diet. Did you hear that? Five to ten percent of your circulating cholesterol only is derived from diet. The majority of your cholesterol is produced, guess where? By you, yourself. Wait a minute. So here's the, here's the current dogma, which is that you have this LDL, which is supposedly the bad cholesterol. Actually, LDL, it, it's a lipoprotein that transports the cholesterol and, deep, and not just to the arteries, but to all tissues. Because guess what? All tissues require cholesterol for membrane support, for repair, and you need it for your hormones. Where do you think your hormones come from? Cholesterol. Where do you think vitamin D comes from? That you make from sunlight under the skin? It comes from cholesterol. So, we're supposed to believe that this bad cholesterol is transported, picked up by, from the liver, where it's made, taken to be deposited in the arteries, that the HDL cholesterol then collects what's left, 
and transports this bad stuff back to the liver whence it was made. Now, the something doesn't sound right about that for a start. Did you know, folks, that most people who have a heart attack, in fact, it's about between 50-60% have normal cholesterols. Did you know that? Most people who have a heart attack have normal cholesterol. Secondly, if you test cholesterol levels in women in the third trimester of pregnancy, most women will have a 59% increase in their levels of cholesterol. Why would the body produce something which is bad for it in excess in pregnancy? Why would it do it? I, I think God has created us uh, with more innate, innate intelligence than that in terms of the processes that go on. Why would we produce more cholesterol, 59% in the third trimester of something which is bad for us? Do you know why, why women do that? It's because the amount of hormones that women need to support their physiology and the baby's physiology goes up in pregnancy. So they need more cholesterol to make more hormones. Makes sense. Did you know that a significant proportion of children have high cholesterol? Why? Because they need hormones for growth. And yet, folks, in 2012, two of the biggest selling drugs were statins, which are specifically designed to stop your body making cholesterol to block cholesterol synthesis. They gross, one of them grossed about, uh, in fact, the average is about 10, 10 billion. Lipitor, which has now come off patent, or atorvastatin, is the biggest grossing pharmaceutical drug ever. It grossed over 125 billion. Right? So, this is what we've been led to believe. But look at this. If cholesterol is low, there are consequences, which are increased depression, increased suicide risk. This is not me saying this, it's published data. Hem increased risk of hemorrhagic stroke, increased cancer risk. Elderly patients with the lowest total cholesterol had the highest rate of death from heart disease. So there is no evidence that supports that cholesterol is, is anything to do with atherosclerosis risk or process? It is present, yes, but it is present because the body uses cholesterol what? for repair. So the current paradigm in modern medicine to try and drive people's cholesterols down into their boots is making people sick. All it's doing is lining the pockets of the pharmaceutical industry that made them. But it's doing nothing to help the health of the nations. Is that too strong? I'm just telling you how it is. You know, I'm, no, I'm as you probably gathered by now, no fan of the pharmaceutical industry. But I'm not particularly just going out of my way to be antagonistic to them. But the point is, they have infiltrated medicine and the way it's practiced so profoundly. And we... And and the, the problem is, with it, we are not changing disease process. We have to have a new paradigm. So, if it ain't cholesterol that's causing heart disease, what is it?